representation of the orientation of the molecule. But if you if you have a different shaped molecule, then you will end up with a different a different theory using different different um, expression for those physics. Okay. All right. Now here's the real real thing. So um, here's 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 our uh, region over. What we're going to do is we're going to, to pick the point X in omega, and we're going to look at a, at a, at a, at a ball of very small radius, center X, say radius delta. And we, we um, so um, the size, so if delta was a micron, then, which is very small, of course, uh, then this ball would contain about a billion molecules, which, which would, so it shows that you can sort of, well, so what we want to do is to, is to, is to, um, is, to, is to think of this point, this is a point, but really it's going to be a sort of ball of small, small radius, but nevertheless, this ball is, so it's incredibly small, it's more or less a point, but nevertheless, it's got lots and lots of molecules. So, and so what we want to do is to is to consider a probability distribution for we're, we're going to pick we're going to pick a molecule at random from this this ball and look and see what its orientation is and that way uh, um, for a, a symmetric um, subset of, of the sphere um, we let mu x of that set be the probability that a, that a molecule drawing, drawn at random from this ball has orientation with plus or minus p in that uh, set e. That way we get um, we get at each x we we get a, a probability what we thought of as a probability measure on R P2. But it's sort of more convenient to um, to extend that measure to a, to a probability measure on the sphere that satisfies that mu x of e is mu x of minus e for any any subset of the sphere, and you can do that by by um, by defining mu x of e to be mu x of e intersection minus e plus a half of mu x of e direct so minus e. So that's way way of doing. It. So, so we'll, we're, we're going to therefore think of, of, of this mu of x as being a, a, a symmetric measure of, on, on, on the sphere. Okay, so now uh, you might also want to not only average over uh, this ball, but over some small time interval because we know that the orientations are going to be jiggling around easily. Motion. Okay, so here's an example. So mu x is half the direct mass of e plus the direct mass of minus e. That would that would represent a state of perfect alignment parallel to the unit x of e. So the probability one of getting an orientation which is plus e or minus e, and probability zero of getting any other orientation. Uh, now, we'll almost always assume that this measure is continuously distributed, so you can write it as a density. So P is going to be a point on the, on the sphere, and Pp is the element of surface area of the sphere. And so we'll have the rho is non negative, it's, it's symmetric, so rho x P is rho x minus P. Well, this measure is symmetric, and of course it integrates up to one on the sphere. So uh, if, if the orientation of molecules is equally distributed in all directions, um, we say that the distribution is isotropic, and then rho will write as rho iso, which we is independent of x, and, uh, and is equal to the one of the four five. Now you, you could you could and Sometimes one does um, use as an order parameter this probability density rho of x, but it's um, 
Halloween at the Dinch point X, you had a, an infinite dimensional state variable. practical thing to do. So, so what Legend suggested to do was to instead use um, moments of this of this um, of row as as, uh, as order parameters. And then you get the finding of a finite number of moments or the finite dimensional state variable. Well what about the first moment? So the first well, since rho of x and p is rho of x and minus p the, um, the first moment, which is the integral of p times rho, is going to be zero. So uh, you get no information from the um, from the first moment. But sometimes one, one considers molecules that really which are, which are polarized, and where there really is a direction, and then the first moment is something that you have to, you have to worry. So what's the second moment? So the second moment is by definition. A matrix stuff called S of X, which is the integral of S2 of P tends to P times rho. And that is obviously a symmetric matrix. Its trace is one because, because the trace of P tends to P is P dot P, which is one, P is the vector, and the integral of rho is one. And also S is a, is, is a strictly positive matrix since. Um, if you take a, a unit vector E and calculate S of X E dot E, well, that gives you the integral of P dot E squared. Well, first of all, that's non negative. So it's certainly bigger than or equal to zero. Could it be zero? Well, it can't be zero because if it was zero, then rho would be um, zero whenever P dot E is zero. But, but the set of P on the sphere. And that's a great circle of spheres so that have to grow and um, have to be supported on, on that um, um, row of vectors. This is, if this is zero, then it means when, when, whenever P dot E is. Is not zero. Right? So if this is zero, then, um, then this is zero. A row has to be supported on a set of points which are perpendicular to to to, um, to E, and, and, and that can't happen because the integral of the because it's a set of measures zero, and it's was one. Now, if you calculate the second moment tensor of the isotropic distribution, which is one over four pi, then you have to calculate uh, one over four pi times the integral of e tensor p, and that's one over th one third times the identity, because um, well, the, the integral of p1 squared by symmetry is the same as the integral of p2 squared. Same thing for the P3 squared. So they, they add up to one. And so um, the, the sum of the diagonal elements is, is, is um, means that the one over four by integral P1 squared is going to be a third. And then, then these integrals, the, the, the off diagonal elements are zero. Because if, um, this integral is, is, is equal to minus itself. Change the P2 to minus P2. So um, the, the second moment of the isotropic distribution is in fact as one third times the identity. Now, uh, tra trace of S is, is one, but the Gen's matrices was traced to zero. Okay, so um, he subtracted off from S the, its value in the isotropic. State so that's the integral of p so minus a third the identity, and that measures the deviation of s from the isotropic value, and that's the gen q tensor, which is the basic variable in that theory. And now 
you see that um, Q is a sort of symmetric matrix, of course. Its trace family is zero by construction. Now, now Q, so, 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 so S is, is a positive matrix. So um, a third of the identity plus Q is a positive matrix. So that means that Q of X has to be strictly bigger in the sense of matrices from minus a third times the identity. And uh, we're, we're going to discuss a lot next week how that constraint is preserved in the theory. Constraint, it's a physical constraint that we need sometimes to, uh, to uh, make sure it's satisfied. So, okay, so let, let's let uh, script E be the set of three by three matrices, which are symmetric and trace three. And uh, we've got Q is in, in E, of course. And so um, we can, we can, so the symmetric matrix trace three, so I can write it in its spectral decomposition. So with orthonormal basis of eigenvectors e1, p2, e3, eigenvalues lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. And, uh, and since the trace is zero, the sum of the eigenvalues is zero. Three is zero. So now we, we can order the eigenvalues. So we can at least one lambda then, the middle one lambda then, and the largest one lambda max. And now we know that Q is bigger than minus the, the identity. So that means that a minimum eigenvalue is strictly bigger than minus the third. And um, that's less than the of third. Little like that, less than the max eigenvalue. And since the sum of the eigenvalues is, is zero, lambda max must be strictly less than two thirds. So um, these are these are conditions that need to be satisfied by the eigenvalues for Q. So conversely, if, if these inequalities are satisfied, then Q is the normalized second moment tensor for some row. And you can construct such a row uh, by approximating this singular measure. So, so this singular measure, sum of lambda i plus the third times of r to e i plus the third to e i minus e i, um, satisfies uh, these conditions. Sense. And uh, so, so you can you can, you can you can approximate you can approximate such an object, and you do it by introducing some 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 functions e i epsilon, which are um, zero if you're outside these um, spherical caps around the um, around the uh, eigenvectors in that matrix. Yeah. So it's a it's a sort of tedious calculation to check that. That, that, um, that row will, will satisfy it as well. Um, we will have um, um, eigenvalues, we will, we'll, so the, the corresponding Q test to this will have eigenvalues of E. So we will have that. Provided the land that I satisfy those inequalities. Okay, now what about uh, so here's a little calculation. So lambda min squared minus lambda mid squared is of course lambda min minus lambda mid, and then then um, times lambda min plus lambda mid, which is minus lambda max because the sum of them is zero. And so uh, that means that um, that uh, since lambda max is bigger equal to zero, lambda min bigger equal to lambda min, that means that lambda mid squared is less than lambda min squared. So if you calculate the, the norm squared of Q, that's the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues, and you check that because the sum, because lambda min plus lambda mid plus lambda max is zero, that's equal to twice lambda mid squared minus. Why it's lambda min, lambda max. And lambda min, lambda max 
is um is uh is uh and then it's next to the matches all the difference in The random axis and the random x squared is random, mid squared is mid squared is two. The answer is correct. Number lambda max plus two. So there will be two, two other minus down. So minus lambda mid lambda max and uh, times uh, lambda mid lambda mean. Lambda max plus lambda mean is minus lambda mid. That's the one. Lambda max plus. So you're saying that's right, it just stands with the root. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to say. If I say it's equal to 2 by 9, then it's lambda mid squared 2 by 9. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. Okay. Now, what about what about the cases when um when lambda max is two thirds? It's got to be less than equal to two thirds, or when lambda min is minus a third. So these correspond to singular measures. So uh, things that you don't expect to actually uh, happen in practice. So if lambda max is two thirds and E max is the corresponding eigenvector, then S of E max, well, E max is, is this, of course, because S is just an integral of E, E, E tends to E units. And that is um, lambda max is two thirds, and that will be lambda max plus one third, which is one. And so uh, we mean that this is this is one, and so um, the integral of e tends to e minus e max and e tends to e max squared, that the two minus twice uh, e to e max squared, and that's zero. And so that means that mu has to be supported on. Um, on uh, on P is plus or minus E max, so it has to be a half the direct mass of E max plus the direct mass of minus E max. So that's a that's a singular measure with with perfect orientation in the direction of the E max. And similarly, if lambda min is minus the third, then for the corresponding uh, eigenvector E min to E min dot E min minus the third. And, and, and that implies that the input of p dot e min squared in mu is zero, which means that mu is supported on the great circle of its two perpendicular to e min. So that's also a singular, singular notion. Now, if two eigenvalues of q are equal, say lambda one equals lambda two is minus s over three, and lambda three is twice s over three. Zero so and Q is said to be E axial, and you can check that it has the form S times E3 tends to E3 minus the third the identity. And the and the inequalities on on the on, on, on the lambdas uh, imply that S, this scalar order parameter, is strictly between minus the half and the one. And so that's the uniaxial case, which is very important. And otherwise, we say that Q is biaxial. 
And in fact, it's extremely difficult to find a cube physically that are not very close to the mean axial with a constant value of x, which is typically about 0.6 to 0.7. So, so one, s equals 1 would be perfect order. So 0.6, 0.7 is pretty good order. And we'll see what that uh, is to be expected uh, later. Okay, now if, if um, Q is in the axial and S is positive, then lambda max is, is two thirds of S, and N is the eigenvector corresponding to that term, maximal eigenvector of Q. And so for general biaxial Q, the, the director is often identified with this eigen eigenvector corresponding to the maximal eigenvalue of, of Q. So this is a little proposition which tells you when a Q is uniaxial with scalar order parameter X, and if and only if the norm of Q squared is 2S squared over 3, and the determinant of Q is 2S cubed over 27. So why is that so necessity? Well, let's, let's compute the norm of Q squared, so S squared times the dot product of it in terms of N, and so that that includes itself. Which is uh, s squared to so n tends to n dot n tends to n is one. Uh, third the identity dot the third the identity is a third because the identity dot the third entity is three. And then you get minus uh, a third minus another third from the cross terms. So that's uh, two s squared over three. And now uh, what about the determinant? Uh, well, we use the fact that the determinant of Identity plus a times so b is one plus a dot b. And that's a q is some is a formula that gives s into so I so I write um so this one so 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 I'm going to take out minus s over three. So when I take when I take the determinant, I'll get minus s over three q, and then I'll have the determinant of um, of uh, n tensor of three n tensor n minus uh, the identity, which I'll use that formula, and you get minus s over s q twenty seven times one minus three, which is two s q over twenty seven times. Shows that these conditions are necessary. And then uh, sufficiency, well, the eigenvalues, if those conditions hold, then we know that the sum of the eigenvalues is zero, the sum of the squares is 2s squared over 3, and product is 2s cubed over 27. So, and, and you do a little computation to check that lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 3, lambda 3, lambda 1, minus a half. Well, and the three squared, that's because the sum of them is zero, and that's equal to that minus s squared over three. So, therefore, the characteristic equation for q is lambda q, the first term in lambda squared vanishes with the trace is zero, and then you get um, this, this expression, so minus s squared over three lambda, and then you get minus the determinant, and you can factorize it. And so, you see that. Uh, a lambda has to be either minus s over three or two s over three. And uh, actually that um, n be the eigenvector corresponding to um, the eigenvalue uh, two s over three, then you find that uh, q is s so it's perfectly identical as you as you uh, want. So therefore um uh, a corollary that necessary and sufficient conditions for a q to be uniaxial with Scalar order parameter in this range is that is that q to the six is fifty four determinant q squared. So I, I eliminate I eliminate um, I eliminate s from the, these two equations. Q to the six is fifty four determinant q squared, and then that s is in this integral. Q is in that, in that interval. 
Okay. So now the Landau de Gen theory is that you use this matrix Q as its uh, as its basic variable. So but, but again we're going to work at a constant temperature and assume there's no electromagnetic fields. So at each point x and omega, you've got a corresponding Q of x. And we're going to suppose that um, the material is described by a free energy density that depends on Q and its gradient and the temperature. So that the total free energy you get by integrating uh, this free energy density over omega, I'll call that I sub theta of Q. And uh, I'll write of C as of C of Q as the domain of QX and D. So this is a third of the tensor, it's, it's a derivative of. Second order tensor, so D is a third order tensor. And so the question is what properties um, should we assume that this C and this is what kind of invariant conditions should it uh, satisfy? So the first is this frame of difference. So we're going to consider two observers, one using Cartesian coordinates x1, x2, and x3, and the second using translated and rotated coordinates. Which are called is, um, x is x tilde plus r x minus x tilde, where r is in, um, um, so z is, is, is x tilde plus r minus x minus x tilde, where r is a rotation. And you're going to require that the v of c that is seen by the two observers is the same. And so, uh, so that the C of Q star at, at the point at the point of X bar at the point X bar um, of C of Q star X bar and the gradient with respect to Z of Q star X bar and theta, but both observers in the same temperature uh, is, is the same as the C of Q of X bar and the gradient of X of Q of X bar. So Q, Q star of X bar is the value of Q measured by the second observer. And so what is that? Well, Q star of X bar is, is the, um, the input of Q to Q is the identity times row of X bar times R transpose Q was the second observer sees, sees that the rotated molecule. And then you, 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 you change variables in integration to uh, R transpose Q, and you get a uh, you know, the Qs by RP, and then you take the R and the R transpose out, and you see that Q star of X bar is R Q of X bar times R transpose. So that's the way the Q transforms, and the, and the gradient is a little bit more complicated. So the, 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 the starred um, gradient. Is d by dz phase of well now we know that q star matching with r q r transpose it's all right that's the same as d by the x p of that one d x p the dz k and that gives me an extra r, r. so this is the way the the um, the derivative transforms with three you know, rotations. So that, that means that um, for every R in SO3 of C of Q star D star theta is of C of Q D theta, where Q star is R, R transpose, and D star is given by this formula. And such of C are called um, hemiotropic uh, functions of, of the Q value. So we'll start. Then we also have um, material symmetry. So um, we, this is the requirement that, um, that, uh, that, that a reflection won't change what we see. So the C of, C of um, Q star, the gradient of Q star is C of Q and the gradient of Q. Gradient of Q. If Z is, 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 is rotated with respect to, is reflected with respect to, to X, so R, R hat is identity minus two is Z. And that's a condition of material symmetry and satisfied by the matrix, but not by uh, cholesterols, because cholesterols have, have caramel molecules. Now, 
any, any rotation in O3 can be written as a reflection times a, so any any orthogonal matrix, any member of O3 can be written as a reflection times a, a rotation. And so for a nematic, uh, then you have um, the same condition as before, but now you can choose the R in O3 and not just in SO3. And such of C are called isotropic. So now, so here's the here's the um, the free energy density again. So what is convenient to do is to split it into two pieces. So first of all, you you put the gradient equal to zero, so C of Q zero theta, and then you subtract that up again. So the so the so the first part is called the bulk energy. You write it as C B of Q of theta. And the, and the remaining bit is the bit that really depends on the gradient of Q. And that's what we call the elastic energy. So C sub E of Q. So, so this is the formula then for the bulk energy. And so now, so let's first of all think what the, uh, what we know about the, the bulk energy. That's got to be isotropic. So it's got to satisfy this condition that of C B of R Q R transposed is of C B of Q of all R. Um, theory doesn't matter that we have SO3 or O3. And uh, such isotropic functions have a standard representation in terms of the invariance of Q. So we remember that a, that a function F. Of Q of a real symmetric from both of the terms of Q is isotropic. Conditions are isotropic, as you see. If and only if we can write it as a function of the, of the trace of Q, the trace of Q squared, and the trace of Q cubed for some function G. And if F is a polynomial, then so is G polynomial. So, um, so that is that so suppose, suppose that is isotropic, so it satisfies this condition. Then you can choose um, R to diagonalize Q. So that means that F of Q is F of diagonal lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. Uh, so as a function, say H of the eigenvalues, lambda I of Q, and then you can choose R to commute these eigenvalues. So that's not going to change F of Q either. And so so that means that this function h is a symmet is symmetric with respect to the permutations of the eigenvalues. So um, now the eigenvalues are, 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 are roots of the characteristic equation. And, and since the coefficients determine the roots of the permutation, that means that h is a function of those coefficients. So, and the coefficients of this trace Q is number of the trace of Q is this term is the product. And then you can write all these things in terms of trace Q, trace Q squared, and trace Q cubed. So these, these formula make you to write trace cofactor Q in terms of trace Q and trace Q squared. And the determinant of Q is given by this formula. So that means that F is on. Um, a function of trace q, trace q squared, and trace q. And the converse is obvious since each of those things is, is, is isotropic. And if f is a polynomial, then, then, then h is obviously a polynomial. And then, uh, then the fundamental theorem of symmetric polynomials tells you that h is a polynomial in, 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 in the coefficients. And so, so that, that tells you that g is a now, so that means that the, the, the bulk energy of CB satisfies the frame of difference condition if and only if you can write it as a function of the trace of Q squared and the trace of Q cubed. And so, as we know, the trace of Q is zero automatically. Um, and uh, if, if for a given temperature of CB is a polynomial, then G is also a polynomial. 
And so you, you just apply that uh, lemma to this uh, this function, which is uh, which is Now, the trace of q to the fourth is a half, this is a kind of another coefficient, it's a half of the square of the trace of q squared. Um, and, and that means that the most, the most general trailing different bulk energy, that is a quartic polynomial in q, is, is, a, is a linear combination of, um, of the identity trace q squared, trace q, q and trace q to the fourth. With coefficients depending on theta. So, so, I mean, you could, you could trace q cubed times trace q would be zero. Trace q squared squared would be all the squared is four. So, so, that means that um, following uh, the Gen and uh, Schopel and Slucky, it was a very nice introduction of the computer theory. Uh, we, we consider this special quartic bulk energy. So it's it's um it's a coefficient uh, a of theta times trace q squared minus two b over three trace q cubed plus c trace q to the fourth. Where we're going to assume that b and c are strictly positive, and that a is a linear function of the temperature theta. So it's alpha theta minus theta star, where alpha is positive. So A will vanish at this temperature theta star. And so we, we, we dropped the constant term, because that one effect minimizes. And we also dropped the dependence of B and C on theta. Um, in fact, there's good reasons to suppose that B and C are proportional to theta, but, but that would only affect the value of the critical temperature you know, you're about to calculate. Do that. So there's there's this 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 function, and we'd like to understand where it's what its critical points are, what its, what its minimizes are, or with respect to Q. So you can write it in terms of the eigenvalues, so A times some square minus two b over three sum of lambda i q plus c times the sum of lambda i to the fourth and you have and so it's, it's obvious that it stands a minimum so the sum of lambda i is zero so to calculate what the minimum is so you can calculate the critical points of this subject to the constraint of course that lambda i and lambda three is zero and um uh, the calculation shows that the, that the critical points are two lambda i equal. So you can suppose that lambda one and lambda two are both there, a lambda and lambda three minus two lambda, and that this equation holds. So either lambda is zero or lambda is a solution of this quadratic uh, equation because it's zero, and, and the roots of that are lambda plus or minus or as shown. And now for lambda um, equal to lambda plus minus, you, 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 you put that into, into a CB and you get that it's equal to 6A lambda squared plus 4B lambda cubed plus 8, 18C lambda to the fourth. And that's negative when this expression is negative, and, and this turns out to be 3A plus B lambda. So the conclusion is the following. Well, here's a calculation which shows that, 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 that three a plus b lambda minus is negative if and only a is less than this expression b squared over fifty seven c. And so what you find is that this model predicts a phase transformation from an isotropic fluid to a uniaxial pneumatic phase at a critical temperature, which is given by. Um, Formula, it's, 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 it's theta star plus p squared over 27. It's, and the, um, and the, and the um, if, if theta is bigger than this, this temperature, then the minimizer is, is zero. And if it's less than it, then the minimizer 
is given by the two norms to form. And S min is given to you, this is the scalar order function, it's given to you in terms of the, in terms of the constants. Okay, so as you reduce the temperature, so above, above um, this particular temperature, uh, the minimum is going to be Q zero, which corresponds to the isotropic state. And, uh, and then as you, as you reduce the temperature below this critical temperature, then the minimum is, is given by the uni axial, uni axial Q, which, which, which shows order in the direction of this vector N. So now the question is uh, what we should, so that's the bulk energy. So what about the elastic energy? So usually it's assumed that that the elastic energy is quadratic in the gradient of Q, so that's like the as in track. And, um, and, and examples of isotropic functions that are quadratic in the gradient of Q are these invariants, I sub I, which are given by, well, the first one, I1, is the gradient of Q squared. The second one, I2, is the divergence of Q squared. I3 is more complicated, so just in this point, I get to QI, take on the J, QIJ and K. And, and I4, so these, these three are the only ones, that, the only isotropic quadratic uh, functions that, did, that, that end only on the great Q. But so here, this fourth one uh, has, a, has a Q up the front. So, so QL, A, QIJ, L, QIJ, K. And um, uh, so let's say the first three uh, span the possible isotropic quadratic function of the grade Q. Now, this is, this is a special choice. There are, there are in fact six possible, possible linear independent cubic terms that are quadratic in the gradient of Q. And, uh, so we uh, we can pick just one of these, which is quite a common thing. So um, now I2 minus I3, you see, is a null Lagrange. So this will, in some sense, correspond when, when we make the uh, transition to the Ozone Frank theory. This will correspond to the set of spray terms from the Ozone Frank theory. So it's a null Lagrange, and it's a sort of rule. Over Omega depends only on the boundary values. Now, uh, an example of something that's hem hemitropic but not isotropic is this one. I5 is epsilon I here, J, Q, I, L, J, L, K. And for the elastic energy, uh, we'll take um, a linear combination of, the, of these five invariants, except that. We'll only use the red one uh, when we're when we're doing um, color scopes. So so L five will be zero for monotonous because for for mathematics we uh, we have some things that it has to be isotropic in this one. So. Okay, so that's, uh, this is a, an expression for the elastic energy. So uh, here's a sort of summary then. So we're, we're going to assume that the pneumatics and cholesterics, the free energy function is given by this integral. The integrand is the bulk energy, uh, which depends on trace Q squared and trace Q Q. And the, and the elastic terms, they've got coefficients which will depend on theta, and the, and the fifth one will be absent with uh, pneumatics. So that um, leads us to consider the constraint theory, which, uh, which is going to correspond exactly to the constraint theory that I talked about in the first, in the first lecture. So a small LR, it's reasonable to consider the constraint theory in which Q is required to be um, uniaxial. Um, with a with a with a constant scalar order parameter, um, so that um, um, 
so that, that so that Q is, is constrained to have this uh, uniaxial form. Um, then the bulk energy just depends on, on, on theta. So, um, so we only have to consider minimizing the elastic energy. But it's, it's, you're minimizing something this, this constraint. Um, now, now the, the, you've got to be a little bit careful. The Li are not dimensionless. So, so you have to be careful in interpreting what it means. Uh, that the small is so very interesting. Trying to so roughly speaking, assuming that the Li of small corresponds to a large body limit, and um, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of work in many people in trying to um, justify the limit, taking the limit uh, that these elastic constants goes to zero, and trying in some sense to end up with this. Theory. So anyway, formally, when you calculate um, uh, c sub e in terms of n going to the n, then you uh, then you get and whenever you have a, a q, I mean q is given by s n times n minus the load energy, so you can calculate the range of q, and you put q of the range of q into into the uh, energy and you, and you finally get exactly the um, the ozone track energy. So, so the, the, the only difference here, so this is identical to what we discussed before. Um, the only addition is that now we, we've treated polysteric. So, so if um, we've got a polysteric, then, then it turns out to be yeah, get an extra term. And so the so the um, the four Frank constants um, are given by explicit formulae in terms of the, the um, L1, L2, L3, and L4. In fact, in fact, this is um, if you're putting L equal to zero, you get the case as, a, as an invertible matrix acting on the an invertible four by four matrix acting on the so that's that's how we uh, uh, understand uh, how we get the ozone track theory. And of course, it's the constraint, it's the constrained ozone track theory. So really you should put these. I mean, it's it's really exactly what um, I mean, I expressed the constraint theory in terms of n, which was n times n, and the gradient of n. And that's exactly, uh, I mean, this is, this is effectively n. Right? So, so, I mean, so that gives you the formula in terms of n. Stop that. So, uh, so next time I'll talk about existence in the matter. Theory and and then I, I, I want to go back to this um, um, issue right at the beginning. Yes, yeah, so um, what we do measure. So we have these uh, these uh, inequalities on the um, on the eigenvalues. Now, if you took that uh, bulk energy, that quartic bulk energy, so, and, and those elastic terms, and you can minimize that energy in some kind of System. There's absolutely no reason why these uh, conditions should be observed. 
by by the internet. So, and that's because that's because you're not that that, that um you're not using what well, we're not using the right part of and the bulk energy should blow up as the right of the so the the so um, so the next time I I'll discuss how you um so so the next time I'll discuss how you um construct a bulk energy by a sort of rational process that will blow up as the minimum binding factor goes to minus the third and the maximum binding factor goes to two thirds. And then you'll know, then you'll know that um, a minimizer will satisfy these inequalities, at least almost everywhere. It's a very interesting question as to whether the minimum binding factor will be bounded away from the use of that. This problem, which is mostly an open problem. Okay, so now the, 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 um, the electron Monday is in the morning. It's after that, so it's not, it's not in the afternoon. It's still so you said that you can we just know that the twice. We want to like the bulk energy penalize that it goes to minus. Well, somehow penalizing having a little zero, it is. It, it, it just exactly it, it's penalizing having a perfect order, which will which will never happen. Yeah. I mean, it's something that's it's penalizing is singular. Um, it's a uh, which corresponds to having a, having a continuous probability distribution and not a singular one. So the view is that the perfect order is not completely reasonable. So the question is to come back to the definition, come back to the next of the that would have worked with the symmetric test of sensor. And I don't know, I don't know about that. But even in the setting, there should be some sort of symmetric test of sensor to have some sort of on, on, but it's like the body. Like in the higher sheet of sensor. Yeah, trace is symmetric. Yeah, trace is symmetric. I've never seen that. It's not quantum computing. It's not really the. Yeah. Yes, sir. I mean the the the, the main the main reason why physicists. And that is an physics and theory, because it goes in and theory has these problems with defects. So, line defects of infinite energy, but it goes in and that is an theory. The defects are, are not, they're not. So, then, then. I thought just, most people think of them as being um, corresponding to smooth solutions of well, the So, it's like it's like it's the usual sort of thing. It's, uh, it's uh, sometimes nice to have a singular theory because you see the location of defects exactly. That's the other trend theory. So, of course, the, the, the man energy theory won't tell you exactly where a defect is. It's sort of smeared out. But the, on the other hand, there's more structure, gives you more structure to the defect in it. And it resolves this issue of the line defects. Of the defect. Okay, so the next 
this one is this one physically extended because so I have the one half perfect but the issue might be cheap, right? Yes, that's right. But can it be arbitrary to do that? Oh, I see. Well, um, uh, I think you can. I think you can get. Well, that, that's the that's the issue. Um, so okay, I haven't worked on the problem, but, but suppose you write on the problem with this with a bulk energy that blows up this thing. I can let you go to minus the third. Then, um, then you know that the that the minimizer has to have finite energy. So that means that the, the, the lambda min or Q has to be bigger than minus the third almost everywhere. So maybe the question asked is, is the question is whether uh, in a particular physical situation the, the, the minimum eigenvalue is bounded away from minus the third. And that's very tricky. That's very tricky. But I some cases, but it's not not that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'll show you because it gets this out. It goes logarithmically to goes logarithmically into infinity exponent and minus that goes to minus that. I'll show you how to get to a simulation. Okay, so the big one not there. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> 